On August 1st, 2010, police were called to a home on Long Island. There, Roy Jones lay motionless and unresponsive. He had been beaten to death by his mother's boyfriend. Upon his arrest, the boyfriend confessed to police, I was trying to make him act like a boy instead of a little girl. Roy Jones was just 17 months old. I often think of baby Roy. He's one of the reasons I do this work. You know, we call his killer a monster. But caging this monster and throwing away the key, it doesn't bring me a sense of safety or even one of relief, because I know all too well that, that act, it lies at the extreme end of a continuum of behavior that we all, in fact, participate in. It's a different kind of gender violence, and it targets our boys. Now, on the other end of the continuum is an experience I had one warm summer evening. I was driving through a suburb of Rochester I didn't know well, and so I stopped into a gas station to ask for directions. In comes a man and his maybe eight- or nine-year-old son. Now, the little boy ran straight back to those coolers to get something to drink, and he brought back a bottle of purple Gatorade. Dad took one look and said, you don't want that one, that's a sissy color. He proceeded to walk the boy back to the coolers to get a different drink. Little Junior learned two important lessons that day, right? First, apparently, purple is for sissies. But more importantly, being a sissy can't be a good thing. It took less than 30 seconds. Gender policing is behavior that's meant to force or reinforce strict gender norms, in these instances, norms of masculinity. Gender policing includes criticism, interruption and correction, teasing and joking, bullying and violence. In fact, enforcing strict norms of masculinity increases boys' risk for being both perpetrators and victims of violence. This was the case with eighth-grade classmates Brandon McInerney and Larry King. Brandon was 15 when he brought a loaded gun to school and shot his classmate. Larry, who often wore heels and makeup to class, had committed the ultimate gender transgression when he asked Brandon to be his valentine, right in front of a group of Brandon's friends. Just days later, Larry was dead. Two lives were destroyed. Gender policing follows, it begins early and it follows a predictable path. Did you know that about 60% of expecting parents will choose to learn the sex of their unborn child? Many will celebrate with what's called a gender reveal par uh, baby shower. Have you heard of these? Uh, people leave their ultrasound appointment with the sex of their baby sealed in an envelope. They give it to a bakery and ask them to bake a cake with either pink or blue frosting in the middle. Now, later, when the cake is cut at the party, it reveals to everyone, including the surprise parents-to-be, if they're expecting a boy or a girl. And there's no limit to the amount of imagination people use to create this big reveal moment in their lives. Instead of a cake, imagine guests at your party emptying entire cans of pink or blue silly string. I read of one couple that decided to shoot off pink or blue fireworks on the lake behind their house. So I have a question for you, true or false? Penis equals boy, not penis equals girl. I know our whole lives we've believed this is true. It's what we were taught in school after all, right? XX equals girl, XY equals boy. But unlike other subjects where our elementary knowledge was expanded, C, Dick, and Jane Run became Romeo, Romeo. One plus one became A squared plus two B equals C. Our schools have done us a great disservice by not similarly advancing our understanding of sex and gender. The reality is that human sexual identity is so much more complicated than this. Yes, our biological sex is made up of our external genitalia and our chromosomes, but also our internal reproductive organs and our hormones. <clears throat> but then we have our gender identity, or our psychological sense of self, and then our gender role, our attitude, our personality, the roles we expect to play, and then our gender expression, 
how much or how little femininity or masculinity, maybe a combination of the two or neither, we choose to share with the world, largely in the way we dress. And then we have, of course, our sexual orientation, who we're attracted to, and then finally our sexual behaviors, those things we engage in for pleasure. The reality is that these are not mutually exclusive, which means that they can bind in any number of different ways, making each one of us unique in our identity. Now, unfortunately, well, let me, let me answer the question first, though. So true or false, penis equals boy, not penis equals girl? Well, for very many people, the answer yes is true. But for significant numbers of others, the answer is in fact false. Unfortunately, ultrasound technicians assign a gender or sex to a baby based on simply what's between its legs, without regard to other biological markers, let alone what a child's psychological sense of self might turn out to be. My concern is that we seem to be so wrapped up in the spectacle of gender that we create an entire mythology of an unborn child's life. Tutu or tie? Quarterback or cheerleader? Guns or glitter? I actually adapted these from real gender reveal party invitations that you can purchase online. Many parents are going to be disappointed when their children don't fit into the neat little pink or blue box that they were assigned. And because of our miseducation, we actually spend an awful lot of our energy trying to change our children to fit these stereotypes. We know that children as young as two receive criticism and correction from parents, especially when they're playing with what parents think are opposite gender toys. And you could probably guess boys get it worse than girls. It's significant that toddler boys are more reluctant to engage in cross-gender play when they think their fathers would disapprove. By preschool, children are repeating what they've learned from their parents, and peer gender policing begins. These little ones are quick to tell each other who can play with what toys, and they often will criticize clothing choices that they think are incongruent with our gender norms. By elementary school, peer gender policing for boys takes on a distinct air of homophobia. Studies of pre-adolescent boys find that they regularly bully each other with taunts of fag and homo, not because the boys think that some other boys have a same-sex attraction, but because some boys have been deemed failures at masculinity. This was the case with Carl Walker Hoover. Carl's mom came home one day to find this 11-year-old hanging from the second-story banister of their home. Carl had endured almost an entire school year of this kind of bullying and committed suicide. Thing is, mom had done all the right things. She talked to the school. They were trying to work things through, put plans in place. But what they didn't understand is that they were fighting something much deeper than simple schoolyard bullying. They didn't realize that they were trying to push back against an entire culture where all of us have participated to one degree or another in policing the gender of others. Boys who are small, boys who are intellectual, those boys who don't do sports, maybe they're into art or band, or boys who are just generally thought of as kind, caring people, like Carl, are often deemed failures at masculinity, not just by their peers, but often by their family members. These boys live lives of ridicule, humiliation, and oftentimes violence. You know, I think it's ironic. The father figure in baby Roy's life, he later said to the court, I'm sorry, that was my baby. I loved him to death. I just can't get the idea out of my head. Could this man in some strange and perverted way have actually loved baby Roy to death? Did he love him so much that he didn't want him to suffer the scorn and the ridicule he knew he would face in a world that makes no room for sissy boys? Or maybe it was more selfish. Maybe he was afraid of the judgment he would face as a man who raised a sissy boy. As a gender researcher, I have learned a lot. And uh, my expectations and my assumptions are often challenged. I've learned that 
Our identity is unique. I've learned that it's fluid, and above all else, I've learned our identity is intensely personal. So I want to leave you with a challenge today in the form of a quote from the great Maya Angelou. She said, I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. <laughs>